thank you so much for staying with us. The Caribbean is home to many of the world's greatest athletes, past and present, who have dominated their various sports and stamped their names in history. However, there is one country that has stood out in its dominance and abundance of world-class talent. Jamaica, the land of wood and water, has without doubt been one of the Caribbean's most successful sporting countries, yet there has not been any solid plan to profit from brand Jamaica. Reggae Girls head coach Lorne Donaldson made comments to the Jamaica Gleaner, deriding the country's sports bosses for their inability to capitalize on the marketability of the Jamaican sports. So this is what he said. I don't think we market anything. I don't see any marketing going on. We might think we are, but we are lacking in that department. In Jamaica, we talk a lot when things are good, but when it's done, everybody forgets. I do not see anything going on that shows me that there is momentum. It is no different from the 1998 World Cup, so we do a lot of talking, but we need action. The Jamaican brand is very marketable and everyone wants a Jamaican shoot. If there is no merchandise in the stadium, it's a loss. These comments hold significant weight considering the worldwide success of the national team's home kit, which crashed the Adidas website upon release in February, and the Jamaica-inspired Arsenal warm-up kit, which was released last year. Well, joining us to weigh in on some of Lorne Donaldson's comments are Tanya Lee Perkins and Gurmaldeep Parma. Good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Hey. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. So I'll start with Tanya first because she's on set, Gurma. So you just stand by, um, of course, very, very patiently. Tanya, what do you make of Lorne Donaldson's comments, especially coming out of a match that the Jamaica Reggae Girls lost? Uh, I, I think those, those comments were made before the matches were played, if I'm correct. Yeah. And I think for me... What he said was right, but I take it a step further to say he's concerned about merchandising. I'm going to be concerned about fans in the stands, people in the actual seats. How do we get people to come out and support the reggae girls and the reggae boys where the office or national stadium becomes a fortress again, a place where there is actual home advantage? And I think that's where I think we're lacking a marketing strategy. It is very clear to me that there is no marketing strategy. As far as I know, there is no marketing personnel specifically employed to the JFF at the moment and I think that's something that needs to be looked at. We should probably look at the model that exists now for the local Jamaica Premier League and for the knockout competition on the Link Cup where I was hired as a marketing consultant to actually strategize for that competition. So I think we need to take a long-term approach to getting fans in the stands. Now how do we do that? Um, one of the things that I think is necessary to look at first before we even look at the merchandising again is the stadium. Um, we've outgrown the National Stadium. We have no match clock. Mm. There is no jumbo screen. When you think about fan engagement and sitting in the seat and being able to look up and see somebody from another section of the stands and the excitement that's being generated, that creates an electric atmosphere where you are captivated for 90 minutes mm. and you want to come back for the next match day. We have an opportunity to get <coughs> significant revenues from people at the stadium. We have a capacity of about 30,000 to 35,000. If you're looking at even just a thousand dollars for seats in the general bleachers area, yes. you could generate up to $50 million for just one match. Yeah. And that 50 million can be put into developing your local leagues and competitions. So I think that's a wasted opportunity. When I got to the Reggae Girls match, um, in Jamaica last week and I'm seeing that there was there were a sprinkling of supporters at the start yeah. and I'm thinking that when our girls come out that must you know to some extent be disheartening for you to see and when you think about what kind of interest we can generate if you have cold sparks the players are coming out and there are cold sparks there's excitement being generated with smoke all of those things that they use in other competitions then they generate more excitement that lifts the play. You'd actually probably see more when you have a sea of Jamaican supporters. I don't know if you saw Colorado versus Oregon on the weekend. And they had a sea of green and, and, and yellow in the stands right throughout that stadium. And um, that created a fortress for Oregon. Colorado had no chance. Right. From the start, they had Psychologically. no chance. Psychologically. It, it, it was like the TKR against the Ghana Amazon Warriors that, on Sunday night. Listen, TKR had no chance. That's exactly what it felt like, Mariah. Yeah. Anyhow, 
<laughs> but that's exactly what it felt like. And I think that, so you look at your sponsors. Are they able to provide T-shirts? Do we give these to persons in the bleachers so that there's a sea of yellow and green when persons come in? Merchandising. Anywhere in the world that you go, once you get into a stadium, the first thing you have is merchandising. You're able to purchase the jersey. You purchase a shirt. Yeah. Half time. What are we doing at half time? How do you engage? There are lots of families and kids. You had a unique audience of little girls that came to see the reggae girls. You had parents who took them, a mom who may not be a football fan. I had somebody turn to me and say, so what's going to happen now at half time? Nothing happened. Yes. So we have to find ways of ensuring that we are captivating an audience that will come back time and again and long term we're building the fan base yeah well we have Gurmal Deep online uh, your thoughts on what coach had to say and of course maybe you can respond to some of what Tanya just said yeah uh, I'm normally going by Goku just because uh, it's my nickname uh, it tends to be a little bit more manageable uh, in terms of what Lauren said I think in terms of momentum I think probably the better word, word he could have been using there is strategy and at times, when I'm looking at the Jamaica setup, whether it be through me attending um, <clears throat> the games back in March with Delano to watch him make his debut, there were so many things that you, know, you kind of looked at and thought people aren't aware that these games are going on. So I was, you know, a little, little story was that I was on a Harmony Park beach that day and it, for the Montego Bay game. And I bumped into like somebody and I was like, oh, how do I kind of get to Catherine Hall? And I was talking to this guy. You know, what are you going to Catherine Hall for? Oh, Jamaica are playing. No one seemed to know. And they were like, this is the first time this has happened. And I'm thinking, how do you not know? And then I spoke to a few other people on the beach. All of them were football fans. No one seemed to know that Jamaica were having a match, you know, in their own home city. So I think <clears throat> definitely that there's an issue in terms of locally how the how the matches are promoted, um, and also some of my experience in Kingston for the second match as well. Just being able to get tickets were, was a bit of a nightmare. I think there needs to be better signposts than 100, percent but also globally there needs to be more of a strategy. We've got a huge diaspora out here. And just some of the marketing efforts here, it's clear that there's a big sponsor, which is Adidas, <clears throat> and they're pushing the association with Jamaica, which is a super cool brand within itself. But there's no real, you know, cut through. So we had Carnival uh, back end of August, which is quite big. Not a single one of the young reggae boys were invited to anything to do with Carnival. Even the kit launch, a lot of the boys are from London. Not a single one of them got an opportunity to go to the kit launch down in Peckham. Uh, and it's just so poorly, I guess, organized and managed because there's no real strategy. It just seems it's such a scattergun approach. And I look at, say, like some of the local partners, is there a way of actually being able to merge local partners and, and multinational companies? So I look at Holiday Inn. Um, they're everywhere, right, around the world, but they're all also all over Jamaica in terms of the resorts. How come that's not being tapped into? But also, who's the official travel partner? Historically, we see a lot of, you know, uh, comments coming out of the Reggae Boys camp about you know, people not having their tickets booked. Well, how about you work with a Virgin or a BA who regularly send flights over? Or are there you know, other uh, providers of, of, of that elsewhere? What are the most common routes you know, into Jamaica in terms of tourism? How can you partner with them? And it just feels like, I think Lawn kind of hit the nail on the head in terms of needing experts. I think there needs to be a, a, a cohesive effort with those on the ground, people like Tanya to see her work, um, and people out here who probably are of Jamaican descent. So one guy screams to mind, like a guy like a Leon Mann with Refresh Sports. Um, done some incredible things out here, had some incredible sponsors involved with a lot of his uh, work, but then I don't see him getting engaged, you know, by the JFF, and that's kind of surprising to me because I'm thinking this guy's got a real affinity, you know, for Jamaica. Um, but yeah, it's like the, the experts are there. It's just getting people to come together and actually work together and have a proper strategy. Otherwise, you're definitely going to keep having the same problems. You yeah. could have Lionel Messi essentially playing for Jamaica, and nothing's going to move forward in terms of the commercial viability of it as a as a national team. One of the things Lauren said, Goku, is that the, there's a lot of talk. When things go well, there's a lot of talk. And um, that's not, that's not just, just Jamaica, because from a football perspective, I think Jamaicans are just as disappointed with the growth of the game since the 1998 historic qualification to the France World Cup as the Trinidadians are with their historic 2006 qualification for, for Germany. And it seems like everyone likes to talk and make big presentations yep. when there is success. But as, as Lauren says, that's where it stops. And, and there is not that trigger to propel things forward after that. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree. That's why I said they need a long-term strategy. And they need to try and merge that with local people who are within the space. But then also people, you know, from diaspora, hopefully, uh, abroad, and actually try and come and create a proper strategy where it's not just talk. 
getting into sponsors who's ha who have these relationships. Because if you notice with a lot of marketing companies or those that kind of match um, sports rights holders to brands, typically they tend to be the same companies and they'll work with the brands you know, time and time again. So how do you identify those? How do you kind of get into those rooms to make that happen? And how do you make it a, you know, a way to spend strategically to help grow what's going on? And no, I, I do agree with that. Um, and just looking at things the way that they've been done, from my perspective, like marketing just doesn't seem to be something that they're looking at. It almost feels like someone's going to say, oh, we don't have the resources for it. But I've always felt that if you have a good marketing team, it pays for itself and then some. It's an investment, really. Mm. Yeah, you know, um, Tanya, I, I wonder about your feeling when, you know, government officials and, you know, private sector to a certain extent um, converge on a success story. And um, it, as Lauren Donaldson says, there's just talk. I'm, we've, we've already pointed out to the reggae girl's success the reggae boy success in 98, Trinidad and Tobago's World Cup qualification in 2006. And there are many rights throughout the Caribbean. I was in Barbados when Rand Brathwaite won the sprint hurdles gold medal in Berlin back in 2009. The, they had a massive function that was uh, televised live um, on, on the night to celebrate his success. Um, Kirani has had many successes for Grenada. Kim Collins won the world 100 meter title in 2003 for St. Kitts and Nevis. And on each of those occasions that I've just mentioned, I'm not sure if any of these territories have, have used those landmarks to trigger the kind of growth and marketing that Goko would just mentioned and you did yourself that is possible out of these successes. Absolutely, and we keep missing the ball. But the important thing is, and that's why I mentioned to start, that we need a long-term approach. I think we can't just try to build momentum and maintain momentum around the performances of our different athletes over various sports because this is not just an issue with football. I think what we need is a long-term marketing and PR strategy that's going to take all our sporting programs to where we need to get them. And this has to be something that everybody as a stakeholder is a party to. Um, I love the idea that, as you mentioned, Gavana is in the diaspora community. He mentioned Leon Mann. That's great. I work with Leon Mann. He actually does PR for one of my athletes, Sarah Mizer, when she races in the UK. So you're looking at reaching out to persons within the diaspora community who can help to galvanize interest and generate momentum around it. But I think that just needs to be long term. So, again, what are we doing to ensure that overall we're building on our sporting program when we look at the football fields that's still an issue we haven't addressed when we look at a stadium we still need a new stadium before we can even get to sports tourism and having people travel to even come to watch reggae boys and reggae girls here we don't have a proper stadium so the long-term approach has to be where we start and i think that um until we have a strategy we're nowhere yeah, and do you think that coach, with the capacity, the office that he held, because we're still to see if his contract has been renewed, people like him coming to the forefront and talking out creates change or pushes that change? Well, it's kind of ironic because eh, he says we do a lot of talking. So that's what we're doing now. And, um, because we can't. It's not like we can go into the GFF well, or go into are, the... As a marketing consultant who has worked in sports marketing for many years, I consider myself a stakeholder with athletes that are a part of the setup. I am interested in seeing football grow. I am more than willing to make myself available to help the program. Um, I believe that if we were to look at galvanizing persons from outside, I always maintain that we need to have the right people in the right seats in these associations that are interested in the growth of the product and then we'll finally get to where we need to. But without that long-term strategy, without the right people, without the brain trust as a part of it, I don't think we get there. Yeah. Well, Goku, uh, based on what Tanya yep. just said and the long-term strategy that she's talking about, uh, how do we get to that aspect? You know, what do you think we need to do? Because you're looking on at what's happening in Jamaica, of course, reading the headlines, seeing all these stories, these, listening to these sound bites from coaches and players. Where do we start? Uh, I, I think, first of all, we need to get people like Tanya involved at looking at a local strategy and people internationally, as I've already mentioned. I think that's the first one. And you've got to be sensible with it. And it's got to be, okay, 2026, that's when the run-up's going to happen towards the World Cup. Jamaica should hopefully be there just based on the pure talent they have alone. Then there's 2030 and actually have people who are there trying to create long-term change. And some of these you know, sponsorship and PR opportunities, if you have the right brand, they will help you grab headlines. They'll help you do things. They'll help you develop you know, the sporting infrastructure in the country. 
also they'll help you galvanize you know the diaspora in england um i i sit here and i look at it and think we've got a huge jamaican community in in england we've got a huge caribbean community why aren't they over here playing friendlies you know why aren't they getting some some games in against like teams like ghana so we were talking about this the other day it happened years ago and i was talking to somebody who works at man united about it and he went oh i went there as a kid i loved it i thought it was an amazing opportunity and this guy isn't jamaican and he isn't gone he either he just loved being a part of that game and a part of the atmosphere and that has to happen and we also have to look at how things are done locally in terms of you know how to sell tanya mentioned you know making it a lot more showbiz when people come out kind of like you know, the ipl and i completely agree with that also, Jamaica have like, a great roster of artists that come through. What you got guys like Valiant, yes. Dexter Daps, who are massively popular out here. Even Jada Kingdom. How do you get them more involved in these games? And is there a way of their social reach helping, you know, brands and sponsorships within football? Can you partner with those local artists who have these big platforms and marry them to essentially the football? There, there's a lot of that around those sports and, and rap music in the US. We've seen that growth in the UK because you know in the uk we are probably like 20 years behind the us in terms of marketing but how can we kind of tap into that space with jamaica and i think people just don't see it as uh, as something that's that's serious i guess but that attitude needs to change and you do need leaders to try and stand up together and move forward as a group as a collective rather than it being one person saying this and another person saying that and it just being taught and people need to be held accountable as well you know if people aren't delivering certain things that they've said they have then leave Goku, would you say that the level of uh, the athletic performances in the Caribbean at this point in our history would be outstripping the quality of administration of sport? Because it does seem oh, quite yeah. evident to me, having been in this thing for decades now, that the administration of sport right throughout the Caribbean, and not just football, is, is sadly lacking. In, in many instances, I would give some of our sporting administrators um, one or two out of ten. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. What you've said there, absolutely. I see the Caribbean, in particular Jamaica, being an outlier in terms of no sporting success versus the actual population. Yeah. You mentioned Kim Collins. I remember growing up watching him sprint, right? He was someone we looked at and thought, wow, he's so cool. He's a skinny little guy and he's beating everyone. He's big, big, strong sprinters. He's killing it, and we all loved him for it. But then we look at the Atto Boldens, who, whilst he never, I don't think he really won a gold medal, but he was always on the podium, right? Or there That's and thereabouts. Crime um, James as well for um, Grenada. So, yeah, 100%. And also the West Indies cricket teams in the 70s and then 80s and 90s, until things started to slow up in, in cricket, at a point the West Indies were absolutely dominating. I remember like watching Curtly Ambrose and Courtney Walsh as a kid, and like, you know, Courtney Walsh um, becoming the world's leading wicket taker in Test match cricket. These are all amazing sporting achievements, and it's historically happened. But yeah, there's always been some kind of arguments. And I look from it outside in. I'm obviously of Indian descent. Um, and I remember just as a kid reading stuff, you know, like what we had like on, on TV where you kind of read um, CFAX is what it was called. And you hear about these arguments, you know, with the administration within cricket. And, and you see it across all the sports. And I, I see a lot around you know, the JFF and what's going on there. Um, it, it's been bad. Like even out here, the key thing for a lot of diaspora players, a lot of people are worried about, you no. Know, them having to pay their own flights because of the whole reggae girls um, go fund me that took off massively out here in terms of headlines but there wasn't much that came back to say actually that might not be the full story um but yeah no administration has been been really poor to be honest and that's across all the sports and it's such a shame because the athletes just keep delivering i, I don't know what's going on there in terms of the grassroots yeah but it, it's been incredible yeah you know um tanya you were um actively a sports enthusiast and a professionally involved in sport when um, the reggae boys qualified for the World Cup in 1998. Were you? I was, I was pretty young when the reggae boys qualified, I know, but, but I'd been attending football in Jamaica for quite some time. Yeah. I mean, I'd say maybe over 15 years yeah. and I hardly ever miss a match. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going here now. The lead up to the historic qualification, the input of uh, Captain Horace Barrett as JFF president at the time, and the newly appointed coach, René Simois, who they went to Brazil to uproot, mm. to come to, to Jamaica. And the kind of marketing thrust and the way they were able to get the entire nation to buy in to the Road to, the Road to France project is 
is something that is indelibly written in my mind as an achievement, as a sporting Absolutely. achievement. Because prior to René Simois coming to Jamaica, no one had realistic thoughts or hopes of Jamaica qualifying for the World Cup. And they did it in a, in a manner that anyone who was alive at that point, even outside of Jamaica, would have been impressed with what they saw. Mm -hmm. To a large extent, we are failing our athletes who are doing well. And you're right. What we did in 98 as Jamaicans was to really, from the top down, galvanize a country yes. around the football. Right. Yes. We saw an inspirational coach who made a country believe. Now, what we have now is a sophisticated sporting audience who we are aware of what's happening in the world of sports right throughout. It's very easy to galvanize support now for what it is that we're trying to achieve. And I think that, again, once we have a plan in place, we should be able to do that. We have to capitalize on the patriotism. So I go back to the match. There was no reason for us to have the reggae girls playing and the seats are not full. Why didn't we use this as an opportunity to have a homecoming, invite people to come and celebrate our girls, invite musical artists, you know, as Goku mentioned, the Jada Kingdoms, et cetera, Valiance, to perform, and we use it as a celebration for our girls. If this is a budgetary constraint, I'm sure somebody would do it for free. It's an opportunity. And we're celebrating our girls who have done so well to go top 16 in the World Cup. So we've missed that opportunity to celebrate with them to galvanize a country around them as we make this thrust to do, um, to make the Olympics possible. So it's a missed opportunity again, and we're gonna keep missing it. I think if we do not continue to, if we do not start to strategize, we're going to be left behind. Mm. I just presented to Goku uh, my own rating of Caribbean Sports Administration <laughs> as about two or three out of 10. Um, would you agree with me on that? Boy, Lance, yes. um, I think there's a lot more that we can do. And I will say that one of the things that I love about football in particular, and I'll say this about the football community in Jamaica specifically, is that they generate a lot of content. So there's a lot of user-generated content that you'll see on a match day that helps to build some momentum. And prior to a match day, that helps to build the momentum locally. Yes. But um, we need to do much more to support that fan base and to support those bloggers, the people online, the, the, the sports maxes and 876 streams and football in 90s, et cetera, that are, that are creating content to sit on Boeing that will go to a training day and, and generate content for brands that are associated and around the reggae boys and girls. So our administrators need to move with the times. I'm gonna put it as plain as that. Move with the times and let's get going. And one of the things I noticed, Tanya, is that the hype is around when we win, or there's a one-off hype, because I've been here. We have a wagon culture in yeah. this country. So, yes. like, if we're winning a match, I say we, I call Jamaica we as well, Which um, there's a lot of fanfare. People are coming, everybody's excited, but the moment we lose a match, then it's the opposite. The stadium is empty, people are walking off. And I think those that are doing the marketing needs to remember that this is a process, as you said. Um, you talk about strategy and all the different things that we have to take, but it's, it's where we support them even when they're not winning, even when they're not playing. There yes. should be things going on where we keep pushing the narrative of you know, building that culture of support. Right, and that's why I said the strategy has to be long-term because it has to start with how are we getting people into those seats, how do we generate revenue to continue to pump back into the program. And as Goku mentioned, mm -hmm. you have to spend money to make money. So if you're thinking about revenue generation, mm -hmm. how are you spending to ensure that you're properly promoting it? How are you building awareness? This is not even something that you need to even call a marketing consultant for. To be honest with you, you can use the model of anyone. Use the U.S. sporting model where as you get in, merchandising starts. There's a store there, you can buy a jersey. Then you go and sit in the seats, you get a t-shirt on the seat, there's something happening at all times. Use that model or use a model of the Premier League teams in England that are doing tours in the summer outside of the season. So they're going to China, they're in Asia, they're in America. They're ensuring that they're across um, promoting so that they continue to build the fan base and these are mature football products I mean the, the viewership for the Premier League is through the roof yes. why would they need to do it so yes. we need to do that at our level to ensure that the strategy is long term and the returns are significant and we begin to match the prowess of our sportsmen and women mm. yeah Goku any closing comments before we put a lid on this discussion just for this show <laughs> no, no. I completely agree with a lot of what's been said, actually. And I think one of the things that people don't seem to get sometimes is that 
you can sell your youth, if that makes sense, in Jamaica uh, and sell that to an audience. Because one thing that I think is incredible from the outside in is looking at how much support, you know, the high school championships get. There have got to be people like the KFCs of the world who are blue chip brands who can kind of partner with you know, youth football in Jamaica, whether it be the U20s, the U17s or the U15s or 14s, but actually tapping into that natural passion to support your own nation and the patriot of patriotism. Um, and hopefully that can match guys being able to get together in a room, have strategy and stick to it. Yeah, well, of course, we have enjoyed your input, Goku, as well as you, Tanya, for stopping by. I think, you know, despite Lauren Donaldson saying that all we do is talk, we need to have the conversations so we can move forward, right? So we're doing that. We're, having, <laughs> we're putting that platform so that we can start the discussion and the discussion does not end here. Let's take a break. We'll be right back.